Many of you know that I grew up in New York as a kid, and one of the things about growing up in New York, I became a New York Yankees fan. And, um, and actually, you know, the Yankees have been very successful, but there was a long stretch from the late 70s till about the middle 90s where they didn't do very well. And so as a kid, I didn't remember the 70s. I was too young. I didn't remember those World Series championships. But in 1996, the Yankees made it back to the World Series for the first time that I remembered, right? And I was in college at the time, and there was a group of guys in my dorm who were Yankees fans. So all throughout the playoffs, we would get together to watch the Yankees in the playoffs. And one of the boys who was in my dorm worked at a sports card company. There was a small sports card company nearby. He worked there, and what he would do is, they w the company was known for rookie autographs. So they would go around to all of these people who were rookies, whether in football, baseball, whatever, and they would get autographs of these people. And so he worked there, and because of that connection, as the Yankees were getting further and further in the playoffs, he started saying, I might be able to get World Series tickets if they make it. Well, you kind of hear that, and you're like, okay, sure, whatever. They finally made it to the World Series, and he said he was able to get four tickets for Game 6 of the World Series. Problem was, there was more than four of us. There were five of us who met on a regular basis to watch the Yankees play. And one of them was his brother, so we knew he was getting a ticket. One of them was his best friend. We knew he was getting a ticket. That left me and one other guy who one of us was going to get the ticket and one of us wasn't. So after the Yankees made it to the World Series, this, the guy who was able to get the ticket said, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a quiz on the Yankees, and whoever gets the best score on the quiz gets the ticket. Well, unfortunately, I lost. But the series started, and the Yankees lost the first two games. So... I wasn't feeling too bad because I'm like, they're not even going to make it to game six. But they won game three. They won game four. They won game five. They went back to Yankee Stadium for game six. And in game six, they beat the Atlanta Braves to win the World Series. I remember sitting at home watching it on TV thinking, I could have been there. I remember thinking, oh, it was awesome to watch them win. That was the first time I had seen them win a World Series, and I was excited. It was great, but I could have been there. And the excitement that I had when I talked to the guys as they came back, they were telling me all about it. They were telling me how great it was, how people were cheering in the subway on the way home, and, you know, how all of the stuff... And although I was excited to actually see it and witness it with your own eyes and be there was something that unfortunately I didn't get to experience, but I wish that I had. Today, we are going to look at the resurrection of Christ. And we're going to look at John chapter 20 and look at the resurrection of Christ through the eyes of the people who witnessed it firsthand. Now, like, just like me with the Yankees, I wasn't there to see it, and we aren't there to see it. We weren't there to see what happened on that day, but we're left with witnesses who tell us what happened. And I think that as we look at this description of the day that Christ rose from the dead, I hope it encourages us. I hope it helps us understand what this meant and why it is so important. So today we are in John chapter 20 and the title of today's message is Life in His Name. John chapter 20 starts with Jesus, who had just been crucified, laid in the grave. And if you could imagine being the disciples of Jesus, they had so much hope. They believed Jesus was the Messiah. They believed Jesus was going to fulfill all of the promises that God had given in the Old Testament. They had so much hope. 
And then on the Friday before, Jesus was crucified. All of that hope was dashed. All of that joy that they had, that they were going to be a part of the kingdom of God, all of the expectations they had on that day all disappeared. We see the disciples on the Sunday after Jesus was crucified hiding because they were afraid. They were afraid of the Jews. They were afraid that they would come after them next. They, they, they crucified Jesus, so what would they do to Jesus' disciples? And on this day, as the day starts, uh, some of the Gospels give a, a slightly different description of, of what happened. But they all go together, and what they focus on is that in the morning, um, John focuses on Mary Magdalene. Other Gospels tell us there were other ladies there as well. They went to the tomb of Jesus. And they went for a very important reason. They wanted to prepare his body for burial. They wanted, there were traditions that were usually done for bodies that they weren't able to do because Jesus was crucified right before the Sabbath, right? So they, they couldn't do all of the work that was necessary. So the, the women wanted to go in and prepare the body and, 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 and do all of the traditions that they would normally do. And in John 20, it focuses on Mary Magdalene. And it says, she came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And as she came, expecting to, to find the body of Jesus, instead she finds the, the stone rolled away from the tomb. And it's really interesting what it tells us she does. Instead of going in to see what had happened, she sees this, this um, picture in front of her, this, this stone rolled away. Um, we also know from other Gospels there were soldiers there who were guarding the tomb. And, uh, and she sees this, and instead of going in and seeing what had happened, she runs away. It tells us in verse 2, she ran and went to Simon Peter and to, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which we believe was John. And she says to them, you know, they've taken the Lord away. They've taken his body. We don't know where he is. And as we begin this passage, the first, the first point that I want to focus on is, is the witnesses to the resurrection. In John chapter 20, we see a description of how people witness the resurrection. We see one example after the other of people seeing the resurrected Jesus. And so first Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. The, the stone is rolled away. The body is not there. She doesn't know what happened. She's confused. She's upset. You could, you could imagine someone you loved if someone did something to their gravesite. How, how horrible that would be. How devastating that would be to you. Someone you loved and cared about and someone did something to their body. And that's what she's thinking right now. But as we get to verse 4, let's read verse 4 together. We, we pick it up with Peter and John hearing this news. And let's see what they do in verse 4. It says, both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So as soon as Peter and John hear the news, they get up and run to the tomb. They have to see for themselves. Right? They have to find out what happened to Jesus. And the, 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 the gospel tells us John outran Peter, but when he gets to the tomb, he stops. And he doesn't go in. But Peter, once he gets there, he goes into the tomb. Let's look at verse 5. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then verse 6, then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen cloth but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and look at this, and he saw and believed. For as of yet they, ha they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. 
we see these two disciples, these two men who God used to build the church of Jesus Christ after the ascension, these two foundation foundations of the church, John and Peter, they ran to the tomb and when they got there, they saw something they didn't expect. They were probably expecting to see just everything gone because if you take a body, you're not going to unwrap the body, right? You're not going to to fold everything and put it neatly to the side. You're going to grab the body and go, right? And the way that the cloths were to to have them lying there um, showed them something unusual had happened. And notice it tells us what John was thinking. When he saw, what does it say happened? He saw and believed. Now, I think it's really interesting here. They didn't fully understand what was going on, right? It says they didn't understand that the scripture uh, told them that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They didn't understand everything that was happening. But John saw and he believed. And then they go home, which is also kind of interesting. Now, after they were there, After they saw, Mary was left alone at the tomb. And verse 11 tells us that Mary was there weeping. Because she was just overwhelmed with sadness for what had happened. And as she is there at the tomb weeping, two angels appear where where Jesus' body had been. And they say to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, they have taken my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. And then she turns around and she sees Jesus, but she doesn't know it's Jesus. And Jesus, just like the angels say to her, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she thinks that Jesus is the gardener, right? Because she isn't expecting to see Jesus. So far we see with Peter, John, and with Mary, they were not expecting the resurrection. And so in her mind, of course, it goes to the first rational thing. You know, there's a person here talking to me. It must be the gardener, right? And so she believes Jesus to be the gardener. And, and Jesus asks her these questions. And she's saying, where did they take Jesus? Where did they put his body? And then verse 16, look at this. It says, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus just says her name. And finally everything clicks together. Jesus just calls out her name and finally she realizes what's going on here. And I think we shouldn't be too critical of anybody in these situations we're going to read about today. Because could you imagine? Could you imagine this situation? We would be just like them, confused, sad. We would be full of sorrow. We would be mourning and and weeping just like they were. We wouldn't have understood what was going on. But in this situation, Jesus says her name. And then she finally understands. What's really interesting about this passage is Jesus didn't appear to Peter and John first. He appeared to Mary first. Peter and he's going to appear later to Peter and John and they will see him and they will be able to to touch him and talk to him but he appears he shows himself first to Mary and there at the tomb as Jesus reveals himself to Mary she cries out and calls him teacher And notice in verse 17, it says, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Jesus doesn't want her coming and and clinging and holding. I'm sure she wanted to just just embrace him and and hold on to him. Just, I mean, when you think of someone you love and, and you think you've lost them, 
And then to see that they're alive. You can imagine just the emotions that, that are going through Mary right now. And Jesus says, don't cling to me, but I have a job for you. Go tell the brothers. Go tell the brothers what you've seen. In verse 18, we see Mary doing that very thing. Mary, verse 18 says, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the, to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. What, we, what we're seeing so far in these first two instances of Peter and John and also of Mary, that, that God is using these things in their life to bring them to a point of faith. We see for John, he just had to see the cloth and he believed. For Mary, Jesus had to speak her name, and then she believed. And all throughout the Gospel of John, what, one of the things I love about the Gospel of John is Jesus, over and over again, reaches people where they are. And no, 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 everybody's different. Everybody responds to different things. But Jesus, as he goes, it starts in the very beginning as he calls the disciples. He goes to Peter and he says, or his name was Simon then. He says, you'll no longer be Simon, but you will be called Peter. You know, something we know about Peter was he, he, he wanted to be important, right? He wanted to be the leader. And as Jesus called him to be his disciple, he said, you're going to be the rock. And you can see how that spoke to Peter. We see just later on in the chapter, there's Nathaniel. Nathaniel is studying, and Jesus said, Oh, I saw you studying by the tree. And for that, Nathaniel said, You are the Christ. You, Jesus knew that for Nathaniel, it, it took something like that to, to speak to his heart. We see him talking to Nicodemus in a certain way, and the very next chapter, talking to the woman at the well. Two completely different people. But yet God speaking to their heart, Jesus speaking to their heart, and showing them, leading them to faith in him. And in this chapter, we see that continue, first with Peter and John, and with Mary. Both of them leave the situation trusting and believing and hoping in Jesus who is raised from the dead. Throughout this chapter, we see Jesus interacting with people. And as he shows himself, as he reveals himself, as they see that he is alive, it transforms their lives. We continue on in the chapter in verse 19. It says, on the evening of that day, I mean, this must have been a day, right? When you read all that happened on this day, this, this is one of those days they would never forget, right? There are times in our life, there are days that are so important, so impactful, that we will never forget them. And this is one of those days for the disciples. Jesus is at work. Jesus is revealing himself. And the people who see him are changed forever. So it says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Once, what's really significant here is by this time, they had already talked to Peter and John. They had already talked to Mary. But they were still afraid. The rest of the disciples, including Peter and John, were locked behind the door because they were afraid. They were afraid for their lives. They were afraid of being arrested. But Jesus comes, and he stood among them, and he said to them, Peace be with you. We know from some of the other descriptions that, that they thought they saw a ghost, right? You can imagine being in a room, and all of a sudden someone appears. And, and you would be frightened. I would be, I would be frightened uh, half to death. You know, I, I, don't, I don't do well with things like this. I would be going, going a little crazy. But Jesus comes, and he says, Peace. Peace be to you. Verse 20 says, when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Even though there had already been reports that Jesus was alive, the disciples were still afraid. 
even though they heard the good news that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. And I think by this time, you know, they might be, might be understanding a little bit more. You know, as, they, as we see in a few places, Jesus has to, to describe why Scripture necessitated that he die, first of all, and then raise from the dead. They, they needed some help. They weren't quite there yet. They didn't have everything figured out. But when they see Jesus, that's when their fear disappears. That's when their joy comes and their sorrow fades away. When Jesus stood there and showed him his hands and his side, it tells us the disciples were glad because they saw Jesus. Throughout all of these instances, we see when people see the resurrected Jesus, it turns their sorrow to joy. It turns their doubt to faith. And it completely transforms their lives. The next illustration is one that I, I've always related to a bit when it describes what happens with Thomas. I relate a lot to Thomas. I already told you I grew up in, in, in New York and growing up in New York led me to be skeptical of everything. Led me to mistrust everything. I still, I, I have to lock my doors all the time. I, people in our neighborhood leave their house, I shouldn't tell you this, cause, but people, <laughs> people in our neighborhood leave their front door unlocked all the time and, and I can't do that. Because of that, just mistrust. I have to lock everything. I have to make sure everything is, is secure. And, and with Thomas, he needed to see. And I can relate to that. So everybody saw Jesus but Thomas. And I think God did this on purpose, by the way. I think we all needed somebody like Thomas. Thomas to teach us what it means to have faith in Jesus. Jesus purposefully appeared to everyone but Thomas. And as the disciples tell Thomas what happened, as they go to him and say, we've seen Jesus, he's heard the report from Mary Magdalene, he's heard the report from all of the disciples, but yet when he hears that Jesus has been raised, has raised from the dead, what does he say? He says, I don't believe it. He says, unless I see his hands, unless I see and put my finger where the nails, unless I place my hand in his side, here are the words in verse 25, I will never believe. In response to the good news of the resurrection of Jesus, Thomas says, I need proof. Now, Thomas is not a bad guy, by the way. Thomas was a disciple, a faithful disciple, someone who followed Jesus, someone who, who God used in, in, in great ways. It wasn't as if he was an atheist. You know, it wasn't as if he was a skeptic. He just needed proof. He had to see for himself. And what is really interesting is in his doubt, in his skepticism, Jesus made him wait. Most of this chapter takes place on the day Jesus rose from the dead, but this last section takes place eight days later. I mean, could you imagine being Thomas for eight days? Peter and John and Andrew telling him, Jesus is alive. Nope, I'm not going to believe. Everybody describing how he came to them in that room, how the room was locked, but Jesus appeared. And Thomas, this whole time, God gave him a week to repent, right? God gave him eight days to say, okay, I believe you. But he continued in his skepticism and in his doubt. And then in verse 26, it says, eight days later, when the disciples were inside and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
Just like he said the first time. Then in verse 27. Then he said to Thomas. Put your finger here. And see my side. And put your hand. And place it in my side. Do not disbelieve. But believe. What is so amazing about this passage is Jesus knew exactly the questions that Thomas had. Jesus knew exactly what Thomas had said. Jesus knew the doubts that were in Thomas's heart. And Jesus confronts him right away and says, Thomas, come here. Touch my hands. Feel my side. Stop doubting belief. And then in verse 28, we see Thomas answer and say, my Lord and my God. Thomas needed to see, but when he saw, he was a changed man. When he saw, he worshiped God. His statement to Jesus is a powerful statement of who Jesus is. And it's one of those statements that we can point to to show us that his disciples believed Jesus was more than just a good teacher. They believed he was more than just a prophet. They believed he was God. Because Thomas, in response to this, says, My Lord and my God. When he saw, when he touched Jesus... He believed and he worshiped Jesus as God. Verse 29 says, Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. In the first part of this chapter, we see Jesus meeting people on the resurrection, revealing himself, and as a result, we see the lives of the people who come in touch with the resurrected Jesus are completely changed and transformed. And we see that they're all different, that Jesus reaches them in different ways. John just had to see the cloth, and he said, that's it, I believe. The disciples who met in the upper room, Jesus appeared to them. Thomas, he, just hearing wasn't enough. He needed to see. But after all of this, you know, we're, we're not given the benefit that these disciples had. I've often, I've often thought about how it would have been like to be there, to be with them on that day. But we're never going to get that opportunity. We will never be able to experience this day that they bear witness to. We, what we have left is the witness of the Gospels, where we see not only in John, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all the description of the resurrection. And they all kind of come at it from a little bit of a different angle. They all share some uh, different details. But when we put it all together, we see what Jesus did, and we see witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Jesus appeared to the twelve, he appeared to Peter later on, he appeared to 500 people altogether. And so we are left with that witness. And Jesus here tells Thomas, you've believed because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Although 500 is is an enormous amount of witnesses to an event like this, millions have believed without seeing. Billions have believed without seeing. And that includes us. We see these witnesses. We read these witnesses. We hear what they, what they tell us happened. And even though Jesus doesn't come and, and reveal himself in a physical form like he did to them, I think Jesus does reveal himself to us as we hear the message. I think Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, speaks to us when we hear the gospel, the good news, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that he rose again conquering sin and death and that his resurrection shows that he is the Son of God, shows that we have a hope of life through him, 
shows us that he is going to fulfill all of the promises. At the end of this chapter, we see John describe to us why he wrote this book. And in it we'll see point number two, that we have hope through the resurrection. Not only are we given this witness in all of the gospels of what Je- that Jesus is alive, but as Christians we have hope through the resurrection of Christ. Let's look at verse 30. John, as he summarizes the book, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the hope of the resurrection. This is the hope that we have, that John wrote all of the things in his book, especially here at the end, the the narrative about the resurrection. He wrote it for a very specific purpose. So that we may believe. So that we may believe. Throughout the Gospel of John, one of, the, one of the things that we see is that faith is essential to salvation. Just like we see in Romans, just like we see all throughout the New Testament. In fact, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We see throughout the New Testament, as as Paul writes in Romans, he gives us a description of salvation. And we can we can see as we, we look through that book in Romans 3.23, he says, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the first part of the gospel. We have all sinned and we all fall short. It doesn't matter how ethical you are, how moral you are. It doesn't matter how many good deeds you've done. It doesn't matter how many times you've attended church in your life. That doesn't matter because we are all sinners. And because of sin, we do not meet up to God's standard. Because he is righteous and holy. Romans 6, 23 goes on to tell us that the wages of sin is death. This means what we have earned because of our sin is death. One of the things we often do in our, in our world today is we downplay the significance of sin. We say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Or we think, well, I don't sin as much as that person, so I'm okay. But what Paul tells us in Romans is that because of our sin, we deserve death. But that verse goes on and says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans 5, 8, Paul says, But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, This shows us that we were in this place where we were lost, where we were sinners. But God in his love sent his only begotten son, Jesus, into the world. And that even though we were sinners, even though we don't deserve God's mercy, God's grace, God's forgiveness, Christ died for our sins. This is the gospel. We were sinners. We were without hope. But Jesus came and died in our place, paid the price for us. Because of God's love for us. Then in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The gospel tells us it's not good works, it's not religious rituals. It's not through coming to church and performing certain things or going through certain sacraments. That is not how we are saved. It is through confession and believing. Confessing that Jesus is Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. We see faith is essential to knowing God. Belief is is how we receive salvation. 
Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That verse tells us it is all of God's grace. It is all because of God's grace. And we receive salvation through faith and not by works. John wrote his book so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That we would believe that Jesus paid the price for our sins. That we would believe that Jesus didn't remain in the tomb, but he rose again. And that when we believe, we may have life through him. When we understand the gospel, we understand that through Christ, we can be saved. But what does that mean? It means a few things. What, what does it mean to have life through him? First of all, it means our sins are forgiven. If we think of it, we, we could think of all of the bad things we've done in our lives, all the times we've fallen, and it, it, we could think of a ledger of writing down every time we sin. Could you imagine that, by the way? Could you imagine a ledger book of every time you've done something wrong? And by the way, it's not just your actions, it's, it's your thoughts too. Every time you've done something to hurt someone, you, anytime you've sinned, anytime you've lied, anytime you've cheated, anytime you hurt someone, anytime that, that you violated one of God's commandments, if we had a, a ledger of all of those times we've sinned in our lives, it would be enormous. And Scripture says, when we place our faith in Jesus, he forgives all of our sins. He takes that ledger and he wipes it clean. I mean, in, in God's eyes, that ledger is clear. We, our sins do not count against us because God has forgiven us of that sin. And, and part of the life that we have in Christ is the joy of being forgiven. So many times in my life when I think of the things I've done wrong, the times I've failed, there is a guilt that just hangs with me, right? And we probably all experience that, that guilt of when we've hurt someone or when we've said something that's cruel or, or when we've done something wrong. That guilt just hangs with us. Part of the life that we have in Jesus that is in that in God's eyes, those things are forgiven. We are no longer guilty and this life that we have in Jesus is not just life here on the earth, but it is eternal life with God in heaven. I mean, so many people live in fear of death. We live in a, in a time and in a culture where, where what people believe about what happens after death is, is kind of all over the place, right? You know, some people believe there's an afterlife, but, you know, they, they, they hope they're good enough. Or, or some people believe there's nothing and, and that's it. Once you die, that's the end. Some people believe that, that you're just reincarnated. And we have so many of these beliefs that are out there. And it can be confusing for people. I've met many people who have just been so confused about that. But for the Christian, we are promised that through the resurrection of Jesus, we will have life after this world. In fact, for the Christian, we are promised that when we die, we will be with the Lord. We're promised eternity with God in heaven so it's life not only in this world that is transformed by the gospel, but it's eternal life through Jesus. It's also peace. Peace with God. Peace in our hearts. When we believe in Jesus, we are given life and hope. When we think about this day, when we think about this celebration, well, one of the things I love about Christianity is that we don't have to just celebrate it one day. And you know, sometimes I think of Easter, and I think it's great, but, but the truth is, this is a celebration for the Christian every day. 
I mean, this is not just one day out of the year. This is our life. This should be every single day we wake up overcome with joy that we have life through Jesus, that Jesus is alive, that we have hope, and that through faith we can have life through Jesus. I just want to encourage you, as you think about this day, celebrate all that God has done. But don't just celebrate today. Celebrate tomorrow. Celebrate next Sunday. Celebrate every day the life that we have in Jesus. And I just want to say, when we look at this passage, it describes what Jesus does when he, when he meets with people. He transforms them. When people have faith in Jesus, they are changed. And I just want to encourage you today and ask you the question, have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you trusted in his work instead of relying upon your own? Have you been trying to be good enough? Have you been hoping that you'll be good enough, that your good will outweigh your bad? Well, that doesn't matter to God. What matters to God is whether you've placed your faith in Jesus. And if you've never done that, I want to encourage you to do that today. And I've described to you what, what, what you have to understand. You have to know, first of all, that you're a sinner. You have to recognize and admit your sin. You have to, you have to understand that you can do nothing to wipe that sin away. You have to place your faith in what Jesus did on the cross for you. You have to confess the Lord Jesus. You have to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You have to accept the gift of grace that God gives you. And if you do that, you can receive the life that Jesus offers. As we come to the end of our time here this morning, I just want to encourage you, if you've never done that, I want to encourage you to do that today. And if you would like to do that, what I'd encourage you to do is just um, come talk to me. We're, we're going to sing a final song. If you want to come and talk to me, then that would be fine. If right after the service, that's fine. Um, but don't leave here today without either talking to me or one of the elders. Or, or We want to show you from Scripture how you can know for sure that you have life in Jesus. And so as we close, don't leave without finding for sure that the life that Jesus gives is yours. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this day where we celebrate life. We celebrate your life. We celebrate that death could not hold you. We celebrate that you have conquered sin and death and taken away its sting. We, we thank you that we praise you and rejoice in all that you've done. And Lord, I pray that if there are any here today who've never trusted in you, who don't know that hope, who haven't experienced that forgiveness, I pray, Lord, that you would work in their heart through your Holy Spirit. I pray that they wouldn't leave here today without talking and, and trying to understand how they can find faith in you and what that looks like. Lord, I just pray that you will work through us and use this day in our lives to encourage our walk with you. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.